Welcome to May's episode of The Community Call. We are super excited to have you here today. We've got a really full agenda. As we started off here, if you haven't uh, seen me in these calls before, my name is Jesse. I do a lot of our community outreach. I also do a lot of our community stories and, and just boosting the actual messages and the, the products and the things that you're making with Hasura. So if you ever want to share a story about what it is you're building, reach out to me at Jesse at Hasura. I'd love to hear your stories. And you'll even be featured here on one of our community calls at some point if that's something you'd like to do. But we're always looking for just hearing it is what it is you're making because we're building hammers and screwdrivers and saws here, just tools, and the actual products are up to you. So finding out what those stories are really fascinating for us, and we love seeing uh, where the rubber meets the road for Hasura. Today's agenda, in brief, we have our uh, Hasura Ed topic, and that is going to be on authorization patterns uh, with, with Hasura. So we've got, you know, we have these really complex auth rules inside of Hasura, and there's a lot of different ways and different patterns you can actually, uh, you know, do with that. And so we're going to be having a look at that with Tiru. Uh, and we're going to be then having a look at uh, some new abilities to manipulate our root level fields inside of Hasura, which has been a big request. I'm super excited for that one. We're going to have the ability to modify and hide different fields. And then we're going to be looking at um, camel case uh, naming changes inside of the Hasura API. Optional, optional, don't, don't stress out. And then uh, some updates for MySQL Server. And uh, last but not least, we're going to have a look at uh, remote schema joins, which is going to be a really fascinating topic today as well. So that is our top level agenda. Uh, so before we uh, start wasting too much more time and watching me blab, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Tiru here, who's going to give us our Hasura Ed topic. And that is on permissions. Tiru, you ready to go? Yeah. So today we're going to talk about uh, authorization in Hasura and look at a few interesting use cases. Uh, we, we won't touch like some of the basics. Uh, recommend you to check the docs and uh, uh, look at a few sample apps uh, for some of the basics. Uh, this kind of is going to be a little bit of a medium level use cases, somewhat complicated in nature. And uh, you, if you've used Hasura just, just for basic, uh, basic things, you, you may not have discovered these yet. Uh, but these show up and uh, in interesting places and you, you can dynamically like you can you can use these to perform a lot of interesting things that that may not be obvious at first covering few conceptual grounds before we look at the use cases uh, so authorization hasura is uh, is an a back system right it's attribute based access control uh, that doesn't mean that it's uh, you might have heard of role role based access control. So ABAC is like a superset of that, and in, in a lot of places, uh, in Hasura docs and in the, in the ways that you use Hasura, you might you might have come across the the term roles a lot more. Uh, but from a, a security modeling uh, literature, this authorization Hasura is ABAC, right? And this reference in the docs as well as you can see it's being shown at the bottom. Uh, so what attributes do we have? So we have something called a role and session variables, right? Uh, we'll see how these are used uh, uh, in, in the examples. Uh, and another important thing is that Hasura architecturally also publishes role-based schemas, right? What, what that means is that for every role that you define, right? And, uh, and you give those roles certain permissions, and that's going to generate a completely new schema uh, that that you can then query against, right? So if you have like five uh, different roles, conceptually you have like five different schemas uh, in Hasura, and then uh, when when you're making a query with that role, you're hitting that schema. So that's a very interesting architecture, and I think uh, uh, it leads to some very interesting properties in terms of like uh, in 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 terms of understanding what permissions you have, right? Because you can clearly see what the schema is and the, and for each role, it's going to be different. So you can see what differences in schemas also emerge because of your permissions and so on. Another architectural thing to note is that uh, the authorization execution itself happens through something called a pushdown mechanism where uh, 
where all these rules are executed not at the hasra layer there they are uh, defined at the hasra layer they are like a lot of processing happens there but the actual core execution uh, application happens uh, at the source right so if it's a postgres database it's, it's the the execution is going to happen in postgres there's some other database it's going to be that database uh, and so on and so forth if it's remote schemas uh, which is very different from database engines it still is going to be pushed down to the actual remote schema and the way that we do that is by having permission rules which which allow you to do that right so uh, so that's very important to know in terms of in terms of the architecture and also like how it impacts performance for example the final thing is authorization is very different from authentication right authentication kind of validates the user uh, uh, verifies the claims and so on or uh, and also like publishes like what attributes they have right what what permissions they they have but you have to uh, uh, so authorization is one level after that where you kind of use that to actually execute some of your permissions and uh, uh, your your security rules right so hasra does not take an opinion on that you there are two different ways to add uh, uh, authentication hasra webhook and jwt both are fairly generic right so you can bring in any custom like you can bring in any authorization uh, authentication provider that could be auth0 firebase uh, uh, cognito uh, octa right and if you have something very custom you have you, if you work uh, inside inside an enterprise and you have your own thing uh, then there's always the webhook mode which which is basically like a generic wrapper uh, uh, that you can call and you can get the you can get you can do the validation and the verification there and get the attributes that hasra needs uh, into hasra right so uh, another thing is that we also like easily provide uh, a way to map your existing authentication to uh, to to these session these session variables or attributes through things like custom mappings so you can just configure your authentication to actually map these certain things for example in your authentication token right if uh, if uh, if something like user id is present in a field called id but you want that to be used as x hasra user id because that's what hasra understands then you can actually configure that directly in hasra in, in the environment variable for for authentication uh, you don't have to write any extra code for that right yeah so this is this is basically a very uh, quick rundown of uh, the conceptual architectural framework of uh, how we look at authorization and and now we'll just start with one warm up example which is simplest example and i'm sure most of you would have seen this already but for those who are very new to hasra uh, this will serve as uh, as a warm up and then we look at more complicated cases uh, so suppose i have a table called user which is what the screenshot shows and i have uh, some rows here right uh, and uh, i want to basically fetch only my data right and that's defined by some maybe something like my user id right which is which is defined by this col uh, column here called id so what i can do is create a permission uh, i can create a role called user which is here at the top it could be any name right and i can choose uh, for select action i can basically define the permission right the permission there are different types of permissions so the first one here is uh, basically a row select permission which means like what kind of roles uh, what kind of rows can this role select and that's given by this permission which says id should be equal to xsra user id right as simple as that and the, at the bottom here you can also see like what the column select permissions are like what all columns can i choose so here i have chosen all uh, so yeah so you basically define that uh when you're querying when you're querying with this rule it is going to run this permission where it's only going to for select it's only going to retrieve rows for which id is equal to access rate right and if i do that uh and uh here's a here's an example of that if i do that like for example i have explicitly become accessor role user here and i've explicitly given accessor user id as two here right i can do this uh in in graphical 
by giving the accessor admin secret. So this is a nice way to like emulate roles and so on. So uh, that's what I'm using. But ideally, you you will obviously not give extra accessor admin secret when you're making your request. You'll be giving authentication token based on how you've integrated your authentication provider, right? And that will in turn have these things inside it, right? Uh, but right now I'm explicitly providing these as headers, which I can do if I have access to it. It's useful for local dev, right? So here, uh, yeah, so I make this query and uh, I can see that uh, the user ID is two uh, and I only get the one row, uh, which corresponds to ID equal to two. Right. In the table, we saw two rows, but we, uh, and this query does not specify any filters, does not have anything hidden, right? Uh, but the permissions are getting applied because the role is user. So yeah, that's uh, that's the simplest example. Uh, here, uh, you, you saw like how roles are created, like the concept of roles, concept of permissions, and how that gets executed uh, when you actually run a query. So now, uh, yeah. So so now we start the real real uh, agenda of of uh, of the session, which is looking at few interesting patterns. The first one is uh, enforcing checks against data in different table, right? Uh, 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 if if you've already seen few of these operators, column equality, column not equal, CGT is column greater than, and so on. Uh, these are uh, very interest. These are very useful uh, op operators, and in till version two, like before version two, actually, uh, we supported these operators only only on the same table, right? But version two onwards, we've actually in, uh, enhanced that, and you can do column comparison across different tables now, right? And uh, this is the syntax. It might be a little bit abstract, so we'll look at an example uh, uh, in the next slide. Uh, but the the core idea is that in the previous simple example, we saw that you could run a check against uh, a column with the session variable. We said ID should be equal to access to user ID, right? Uh, but now you could actually do comparisons against columns again in different tables. Uh, to uh, to give you an example, we're going to build a shopping cart, right? We're going to model a shopping cart and what permissions it should have. Uh, a shopping cart is basically some some place where you can add a few items, and those items are only valid if uh, if they are present in the inventory, right? So here I have two tables: shopping cart and inventory. And uh, shopping cart has a relationship with uh, uh, has a relationship with inventory. And the the check that I'm running here is that uh, maybe maybe I'll I'll also show the tables here quickly. Uh, yeah, so inventory has like for each item it also has a stock, right? Uh, like how much is available right now in in the inventory, right? Uh, and shopping cart has the user ID, the item ID, and the quantity, like how much does, does the user, user want to add that item, right? And this item ID is, has a relationship with inventory, right? That's an obvious relationship between shopping cart and uh, inventory. Yeah, so coming back here, uh, view slideshow. Yeah, so I, I want to run a custom check uh, whenever uh, I, like I choose like an item and give some quantity to for that, I want to make sure that that shopping cart is created only if uh, the stock in the inventory is greater than uh, the quantity in the shopping cart, right? Uh, yeah, so to see how that works in action, if I basically insert a shopping cart, I'm going to create a shopping cart, I've put the ID, uh, the item ID here, right? I've said quantity is 11 and the user ID is one. I mean, these are just sample inputs. User ID could probably be preset as well, but here I'm just explicitly giving that. I guess you wouldn't do that in, in an actual application. You will actually preset that and set that to something which is coming from the token. 
uh, but anyway, so the quantity is eleven, and uh, if if you note if you noted uh, in in the inventory uh, in the inventory table that I showed earlier, uh, the stock value was ten, right? So this is actually uh, higher than that, and that's why if you execute this, you're going to get a permission error, right? Uh, not not the most verbose. Uh, I mean, it requires deciphering, but yeah, if, if, uh, you should probably uh, parse this to give very good a much better uh, error response to users. But yeah, so the permission check is kicking in because the quantity here is 11. And if the quantity is lower than 10, like nine, then it's going to go through and your shopping cart is going to be uh, created, right? So this was the first pattern. Uh, uh, wanted to call this out because we recently enhanced an existing thing uh, to span across different tables. Uh, pattern number two here is uh, uh, is slightly specific to Hasra's implementation of GraphQL. So I wouldn't call this a a, a pattern in the very broad sense of a, a application pattern or a security pattern, but it's still very useful to know. Uh, so if if you create uh, if you create like a role called public, right, and you want to give give it like open access to all rows, but you want to only show ID and name for those rows and not email, which is what I've, I've deselected email here. So you can see everyone's ID and name, right? That's what public role does. Uh, so yeah, so you can query with role public, you can query the ID and name and you get that back. You get both the rows now, right? Uh, but if I also queried email, right, it's going to throw a validation failure because the email uh, field was not even added to the schema. And remember going back to the very first slide, I said, as far as role-based schemas, and this is an example of that, uh, that because your permission did not allow for the email column, it does not even surface in the schema for the role public. And you're going to get a validation failure. Uh, this is slightly annoying because now, depending on the role, you have to construct like specific queries, right? For example, if if I if I actually I want to be a user role and I want to get ID name and email uh, for my data, right? Uh, then I have to write a query for for that. Uh, it will have three fields, and for other things. Uh, for the public things for i for id name for other other folks or other rows uh, i will have to generate a different query so this is kind kind of annoying and uh, this is by design but what we can do is instead of e like email throwing a validation failure email we could actually return email to be null for all these users right and that would that would be equally good uh, because you're not you're not losing any data and you have a very specific like you have a, you have a generic uh, query and you can use it across different roles so how do we do that how do we turn this validation error to return null which has been a common thing we have seen uh, many users ask uh, is by actually creating a dummy role which i have called nuller here so dummy role because if you look at the custom check here i have set id less than 0 you could you could basically put any custom check here which does not return any rows i i have a database con constraint or my modeling of my application enforces that ids are always like greater than zero uh but i have created a role which is checking if id is less than zero so it's always going to return an empty empty set but i have selected all the columns here right id email and name uh, so it's it's going to have these so so this role is going to have all these three fields but it's not going to return any row any like ever and if you're not aware of inherited roles asura has inherited roles where you can combine different roles together and there is a specification of how that gets combined uh, and uh, so what will happen actually is that i've created a role called public enhanced which is combination of nuller and public and what it's going to do is it's going to combine the row, row permissions and column permissions. And you can now query ID, name, and email, and it's going to return email as null and uh, 
uh, email is null for both those fields, right? So select permission get, kicks kicks in, uh, and the column permission also kicks in, right? So that's pretty cool. That's a that's a interesting, and I think uh, uh, if you really need this, then it's it's a nice way to get this behavior. Uh, right. The third thing uh, is uh, is like when you think of attributes, you probably think of attributes in the sense that it it is kind of static. It belongs to uh, it belongs to the bearer. It belongs to maybe the user, right? But it need not be like that. For example, uh, we had a use case where we want to insert into a table if an existing record defined by say a username, right? Is older than 60 days. So that's that's a very interesting use case. Uh, 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 and the way that you can do that in Hasura uh, is by actually adding another, uh, another attribute, like another session variable called XHasura timestamp, right? It could be, it, I've just named it timestamp. But the modeling here is pretty pretty neat, where you can actually say that insert, and this is a not here, so it's going to negate whatever is inside. So you're going to check if there is, uh, so ex there's exists here, which is basically going to check if there exists some row which satisfies this where condition in this table, right? So for example, for public uh, in, in in the test table, you want to check. If there's a name which is equal to XSR username, right? With a timestamp. Uh, so every row will have a timestamp. The timestamp, which is greater than XSR timestamp. Right? So what is XSR timestamp? Like you can imagine, like you, you're probably going to set something which is current date minus 60, 60 days, right? Uh, and this this is something that you can calculate on, on, the, on the client side if you want. Something that you can calculate at, at the webhook side uh, depends on like how much how much flexibility you want in in, in this uh, this header, right? And uh, yeah, so basically it's going it's going to do this It's now dynamic, right? Because extra time is going to change uh, every time, and then you use that to check whether such a row exists. And if it does not exist, then you let the insert go through, right? So basically, yeah. So many, many at many places we have seen that uh, it's not obvious like what at like what if you, what attributes a user should have. You can be as creative as you want, right? Depends on your use case. Uh, the final thing this is the this is the last one I have uh, is modeling dynamic roles, right? So roles in Hasura is a is a uh, is a Hasura specific concept, right? Uh, but maybe you have an application where you have, you, it's like a, it's an application like Reddit, right? Where you have different groups, users can join those groups with different privileges. Like for example, somebody could be a viewer, somebody could be an editor, somebody could be an admin, so on and so forth. So it doesn't make sense if your application is inherently creating a lot of roles, it doesn't make sense for you to create a Hasura role for each of those things, because that's going to be very dynamic. You're going to be changing the metadata too often and so on. So you're going to model that in the application level itself, right? And the way that you can do that, uh, I've set an example here is, for example, you can have a table called group permissions, which has a group ID, user ID, so that you can know which, like which user belongs to which group and the role a column called role, a text column, which defines what role uh, they should have in that group, right? And, uh, yeah, so for example, uh, here uh, in group ID, user ID one is creator, uh, user ID uh, two in the same group is an admin. And uh, yeah, user ID three is an admin for group two. You can fairly fairly straightforward modeling of roles for each user and group. And uh, suppose uh, you wanted to have a comments uh, table, right? And you wanted the creator to obviously create and update their comment, but he also wanted say an admin uh, to update other other folks, uh, other users comments if they're in the same group of which they are the admin of. So you can basically use something like exists. We saw a preview of that in the earlier uh, use case as well, 
uh, but yeah, exists is a is a very powerful feature where it kind of decouples uh, it kind of decouples your tables permissions, right? It's not tied to specifically your table itself. Exists can basically reference any other unrelated table or anything actually, right? So yeah, that's what we we are going to be doing here. In in some sense, what I mean at a high level, what we are doing here is that we are checking the group permissions table on comments. We are checking the group permissions table for a user ID which is equal to accessor user ID coming from a token, and the roles should be in creator or admin, right? And some a little bit of cut off here with, but it actually goes through that goes through a relationship so that the group ID is inherent uh, in the in the uh, in, in the actual execution, right? So you're just checking for access for user ID and if the role is these two roles. So yeah, so basically uh, you can create dynamic roles if that's your application and uh, you can model them uh, however you want by using exists and some of these other operators that we saw. Uh, yeah, that's all I had uh, back to you, Jesse. Thanks, Tiru. That is was a fantastic presentation because this is really one of the, the magical parts of Hasura to really get that right. And I just wanted to stress too, that is Hasura layering metadata on top of your existing database. So you're able to get these permissions and controls without modifying the underlying data structures, which is a really critical concept there. So you can take an existing database get very secure uh, lockdown and, and creative controls on that without actually modifying underlying data. So really a fast, uh, just a fantastic talk and presentation. And there's so much to dig into each of those topics. So if that's like, something you would even like on a workshop level or something to have a much more deep dive on, let us know and we can try to arrange to have that happen because this really is one of the, the power features of Hasura to be able to uh, really unlock what you can do with this product. So. Super cool. Also, one quick throw out. Uh, what I learned about the fallback strategy there for the ID of zero, that was really cool. Um, if you're into that space and you have a problem with you know different roles having different access to fields, also have a check out with Fluent GraphQL clients. That's another way where you can do uh, conditional querying of fields at runtime. So that's something that you're into or having a problem with, I just want to do a quick throw out uh, for that space. We're going to bring on Karthik now to talk about uh, hiding root level fields with a brand new feature inside of a service. So Karthik, you ready to go? Okay, so today I'm presenting a new feature that I've been working on recently. It's called the disabling of query or subscription root fields. So first I'll uh, First, I'll go through what this feature is, then I'll be showing a demo. Okay, so what does Hasura currently do? So whenever you track a table in Hasura, it will automatically try to uh, expose three root fields. The, the select root field, which is this. Uh, the table, you can select by the primary key and the select by aggregate. So the select aggregate requires uh, Request the role to explicitly allow aggregations in the in the select permission. Uh, so unless that is enabled, that uh, the select aggregate won't be exposed. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so uh, let's see. We have to solve this problem. Uh, we have an authors table and we have an articles table, and we we want a role which which fully allows uh, access to the articles to which the role has. Uh, to which to the authors the role has access to. So uh, now since author the authors and articles uh, are related, so articles has a foreign joint to the uh, authors table. So we have a we have a relationship defined. So, uh, so there's an uh, array relationship between the authors and articles. So so we want we just want the uh, uh, role to only get the articles which are related to a user. So, and we don't, and, ex, and, and the next thing is we don't want the critic role to be, to access uh, the, the articles table directly. So, the, so, in, so currently you, there's no way to do that in Hasura. Uh, the, so if you track a table, the uh, root fields are automatically exposed. Uh, so, this is how uh, so this feature uh, uh, helps to do with it so okay so now this is the uh, articles 
this is the article on the left side left hand side is how the new select permission i mean after this feature so this feature adds two new two, two new keys in the select permission it is the query road field and the subscription road field so what here so the thing we are we are saying here is that we don't want to uh, we don't want this critic role to access any of the root fields neither in the query root fields nor in the subscription root fields and the um, the author author select permission is pretty straightforward uh, okay so i'll show a demo of this uh, okay so so this is what i'm talking about so the i've set the role to critic and uh, the, this, let me just execute it so critic so you can see that I'm, I'm getting the author and the and their articles but if i try to do something like so the critic uh, can only access the author's table and so this is how they are accessing now let's see if i just do articles see uh, as i showed you in the in the slide that uh, i've explicitly disabled all the road fields so you can see that I'm, I was not getting any auto so any auto complete, which means that the articles is not in the um, in the schema. Let's so try to run it anyways. So you get that the articles field is not in the query because I have disabled it. Okay, so this is one use case, and so yeah, the other use cases you want you only want to you only want to um, allow allow a uh, role to uh, access access a table only when they have the primary key value. So in that case, what you can do is in, in the query root fields, you can just do, you can just enable select by PK. So only if they have the primary key value, they'll be able to access the table. Yeah, thanks Karthik. So if there are any questions, definitely ping in chat because uh, there's definitely a lot to, to uh, discuss in that topic. It really is a great way though, when you're talking about, especially when you're talking about some federated cases or you're talking about situations where you're really wanting to ship a very lean API uh, that you don't want to flood the top level to your developers. This is a really great way to be able to just ship a nice uh, clean solution. So thanks Karthik. Our next uh, presentation is going to be from Paratosh and it's on uh, uh, camel casing. Uh, hey folks. I yeah, it Hasura does. And I work at Hasura and I have been working on this new feature called naming convention uh, for past few weeks. Uh, so I will quickly uh, go through what this new feature is and how we can use it. Uh, and then we will quickly take a look at the demo. Uh, so uh, if we have some fields uh, that are exposed in NG, uh, it looks something like this. The field names are snake case, the arguments are also snake case, and the type names are also snake case. Uh, the SG provides us uh, some tools using which we can uh, customize these things. The field names, uh, they can be customized using the custom field names or custom table names. The type names and uh, arguments cannot be customized as of now. Uh, so uh, we, we can take a look at this new feature. Uh, so in this new feature, uh, we are going to expose two different conventions. One is Hasura default and one is GraphQL default. The Hasura default is uh, the default na uh, naming convention that will be used and uh, the field names and type names and arguments are all snake case as it was and the enum values are also as defined in uh, the postgres table as it was as of now and the graphql default uh, convention this thing have field names and arguments as cam camel case and the type names are pascal case and the enum values will be all uppercase irrespective of whatever was in the Postgres table. So how can we use this feature? Uh, so this is a Postgres only feature. So if you have Postgres tables, then only you can use this, but we are going to uh, extend the support to other databases soon. And the second thing is this is an experimental feature. So if you want to use it, uh, you have to enable the feature first using the experimental feature plan or the environment variable. And uh, you can uh, use this naming convention by setting the default naming convention or setting the first source, source customization. So if we set the source customization using the metadata APIs, add source or replace data, uh, replace metadata, uh, then uh, you know we can set the source customization to use the naming convention GraphQL default or Azure default. And uh, we can also set this 
environment variable called Hasura GraphQL default naming convention, uh, which will set the default naming convention that will be used across the sources. Uh, so this source customization uh, has higher precedence than the default naming convention and uh, there is no console support uh, as of now but we are working on it and it will be uh, soon implemented. Uh, so let's quickly uh, take a look at the demo. Uh, so I have this SG uh, instance uh, which don't have any fields. Uh, we can add one field. Uh, so. I will just install this template, uh, hello world. Uh, it exposes a bunch of fields here. So we can take a look at the schema also. So the field name, the arguments and type names are all uh, snake keys, as you can see. So I have turned on the experimental feature flag. Uh, so I can you know, set, uh, add a new data source. So I am adding this new PG add source using the metadata API and I am setting the naming convention to use the uh, GraphQL default. So let's quickly add this. Uh, now I would have to uh, track the tables. So uh, this has three tables in it, uh, days of week, message data and user data. Let's track them all. So uh, days of week, it's supposed to be uh, enum table. I will quickly set this as enum table. Uh, so this is nothing just, it has the, name of the days and we have message data and user data. Uh, so now take a look at the schema. So as you can see, uh, yes, these are uh, the fields that are from the second uh, PG source that I have just added. So as you can see that the field names are uh, all you know, uh, camel cased and the arguments are also camel cased uh, and the type names are Pascal cased. So uh, let's take a look at the enum thing. So in the enums, uh, the values are all uh, uppercase as we were expecting. And uh, now quickly take a look at uh, uh, take a look at the default naming convention. Uh, so I will just stop this at G and then I will set the environment variable to set the default naming convention to GraphQL default and then I will just start the SG again. Okay, uh, cool. So the SG is running. Uh, let's reboot this. Okay. So now as we can see the first source also is now using the GraphQL default. It was using the Hasura default previously. And the second thing has source customization set, so it is using the GraphQL default. Uh, so that was all uh, from me. Uh, I hope you enjoy this new feature and uh, use it in, in your project. Uh, so uh, thanks, Jesse, and thanks, everyone. Uh, Great presentation from Paratosh, also first time presenter for uh, for the Hansur community call, and it was uh, that was great. So. I think we saw some people that were saying, yes, we were looking for camel casing. Um, and that's definitely one that people have been requesting actually for like quite a while. It's apparently a really uh, much wanted feature. So we're excited to see that uh, landing. Next up, we have uh, Naveen and Naveen is gonna be giving us a quick look at updates to Microsoft SQL Server. So Naveen, you ready? So hey folks, I'm Naveen and I'll be showing you a quick review of the MS SQL event trigger support. Uh, so as many of you might already know that Hasura does support event triggers for Postgres sources, but, uh, and, 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 and the MS SQL support is very similar to the Postgres event triggers. So before I go to the demo, I like to give a very, very quick brief of what event triggers are. To the very short intro of event triggers are, they're, they're pretty similar to the SQL triggers that we use. That is say, for example, um, Whenever you insert anything, say suppose you create a insert event trigger with Hasura, then whenever you insert anything to the table, uh, Hasura will basically construct a payload uh, which has information of what the old data was and the new data was and will deliver it to your webhook. So to summarize it, basically event triggers, uh, they capture the events on specified tables and invoke webhooks to carry out any custom logic that you might have. So this, let's go ahead and just see a demo of how one can create an event trigger with MSQL source. And there we go. 
Okay, so first, uh, the first thing would be to see the console and I hope the size is okay. So I have already added an MS SQL source, as you can see, it's an MS SQL source with the dialog version and stuff. And this database source has the table books. And yep, yeah. and now since the console support is not yet there, okay, yeah. So so to create it, uh, event trigger, the first thing is add an MS SQL source, and the second thing would be to create a webhook. This webhook would be the one which would be receiving all the payload whenever any data changes, right? So I created a very simple webhook, which simply gets the data that Azura sends and prints it out. So I'll just switch on my webhook and then let's create an event trigger. And this uh, this API called MSQL create event trigger basically creates an event triggers on the table books and, the, uh, and our webhook is being served at the 5,000 host. So let's add it there. And this will listen for all the changes whenever any insert happen for any of the column of the books table or any update event happen for any of the columns of the books table. So let's create the event trigger and see the message success. So let's go ahead and try to insert a book and see what does Hasura send to a web book. So let's we have your books here. And I would like to insert an ID name and I will like to them back the affected rules and ID name. So see, I'm gonna see uh, let me insert this book. Okay, so as you can see here, uh the whenever the insert happened on the books table, Hasra sent back this response, and that basically response contains your old data, new data and all the extra information that you need so folks so this is this was a demo of how one can use even bigger premises sources sources and that's it yeah and yep thank you thank you thanks everyone if you haven't explored event trigger on the side of Hasura, you are messing you are missing out because that is again events authorization i mean really these are just some of the features that allow you to build crazy apps so great presentation thanks for doing that um and now for our ms sql people which we have a lot uh you, you now get event triggers so uh, enjoy that let us know what you build and uh, report any bugs or whatever else you may encounter because yeah this is this is one of the tenets of building powerful applications with uh with Azura. if you're curious about more on those tenants uh, have a look up three factor applications there's some more information about that that will be interesting to you um so next up we have our last presentation for the day and that is from Praveen talking about remote schema to remote schema relations. So Praveen, you are up. Awesome. So, um, hey folks. So today I wanted to talk about uh, GraphQL joins, which is our remote schema to remote schema joins, right? Among a few different types of joins that you can do with, uh, with GraphQL now. Um, right, so um, just a quick look at the architecture. Uh, we have like, um, GraphQL APIs uh, that we've been adding it as remote schemas to Hasura for for a long time. Um, they've all they've always been siloed, isolated, uh, right? Uh, but now um, with GraphQL joins, what you can do is you can add those two GraphQL APIs uh, and then establish a relationship between them. Uh, we've always been able to establish relationship between tables in a database uh, that we've done before. Now with, with GraphQL joins, what you can do is you can add two independent GraphQL servers. And then uh, if there is a, if there's a field that's, that, that can be mapped, then you can uh, establish a relationship uh, using configuration, right? Uh, and, and, and the best part about this is that you don't need to modify any of the code in any of these services. Um, and, and it's all declarative on the Hustler side of things, right? So, uh, so rough architecture, you have GraphQL APIs, join them, uh, and, and the front end of the client will basically make the same API call uh, to Hasura, and Hasura will make the proxying bit uh, uh, implemented fill. Cool. Um, there's also another type of join that I wanted to demo today, which is the remote schema to database joins, right? So now you have like a remote schema that's added, uh, but there's also data in the database, uh, posters, for example, um, and you want to join data between them. You can also do that now, uh, right? So you can do a remote schema relationship between these two data sources. Um, things to know before we deep dive into a demo is 
that could be type conflicts typically with the remote schemas as you keep adding types and whatnot and and if you're adding two different schemas uh mm -hmm. the, the the potential of getting conflict is, is pretty high uh so there are ways to handle things um so with with hasura you can do graphical customization of all of these root fields and and your nodes and 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 whatnot so you can do field level customization so you can add a prefix or a suffix to avoid uh, type conflicts you can add uh, root customization as well for the query root fields uh, on using the Hasura console to avoid all of these conflicts right you can do this for both the database side of things and also for uh, for the remote schemas that you're adding all right so then uh, how do you handle schema changes so once you've added a remote schema uh, you've done some join uh, with some configuration but what what happens if schema changes uh, uh, over time right and and how does that get reflected in the in the in the api layer so typically when remote schema changes uh, the way updates are handled at hasra is that you reload the schema uh, through metadata reload and it will refresh the schema right but there is also a case where the schema could end up in a breaking change so so two ways to handle this um so if there is a schema change uh, in your CI/CD pipeline, you will make sure that there is a metadata reload that happens, um, and and that will ensure that the changes are propagated, uh, the new introspection will happen, and and the schema is propagated. Uh, and if there is a breaking change, for example, uh, then when you're applying these changes, uh, there will be a hustle metadata inconsistent uh, error that will be that will be thrown. So. So in your in your CSCD pipeline again, this can give you like a like a health check on your metadata, saying that hey, you still have inconsistent objects. So uh, do not proceed, fix the type conflicts if there are any, and then uh, go further for for the changes. Right. So so all of these production ready concerns, uh, there are solutions and there are ways to think about these. And I just wanted to talk about these two in particular before we go into the demo. Um, so for today's demo, I have a couple of schemas, a couple of DraftKill servers that, that are just uh, running locally on my machine. One is like a store schema, which has like some order uh, order query, uh, you can fetch some items and whatnot. There's also a fulfillment schema, which lets you track the status of the order. Uh, incidentally, there are two independent DraftKill servers uh, running. And, and 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 the common parameter between these two uh, schemas is the order ID. So for the fulfillment schema to track the status of the order, you have the order ID coming in. And for the sto store schema, you also have the order metadata information like the order items and the price, the quantity, and and whatnot. Right. So, so there are two servers running, and let's see how we can uh, join data between them. Uh, so I'm just heading to the API Explorer to show you what the two independent schemas look like from a querying bit. Uh, I'm going to make a query to fulfillment API, just passing in the order ID. Uh, and there are like a couple of fields that you can fetch, right? So the simplest query, uh, this is from a service which is exposing these queries. This is a fulfillment query. And there's another query that you can make to fetch the order details, which is from a different query, uh, but dif different graphical server, for example. Uh, you pass in the order ID, let's say uh, one, and fetch in some details. You have line items, you have item, and an ID and price. Lots of nesting, but then you're getting data from a different server now, right? Now, when you let's take an example of a front end uh, page where uh, you're showing the status of the order but you also want to show the line items in the price in the same UI. Now you want to join data of these two APIs, right? Typically you would have made two different HTTP calls uh, to do this use case. Uh, now with GraphQL joins, what you can technically do is, uh, what you would want to do is um, make a query to fulfillment, uh, pass in the order ID, let's say one, get the ID, order ID and status. Now, instead of just the order ID, you typically want to actually fetch the order in line uh, and which will fetch the data from the second server, which we just uh, made a query to. Right? So this is the data that's coming in. And I want this particular object to actually come in uh, in, in this order object right, that I can query. So for this, let's establish uh, a relationship now. Uh, let's head to fulfillment uh, GraphQL uh, schema. 
I go to relationships. And, and here are a couple of options. You can establish a relationship between one remote schema to another remote schema or one remote schema to a database that you already have configured. Uh, in this particular one, uh, there are two schemas that I'm using, fulfillment and store. I, I want to connect the order ID from fulfillment to the store's order ID, right? So I'm going to give the relationship name called order. Um, the source remote schema, as you see here, it's fulfillment. I'm on this particular remote schema and I want to select the fulfillment query. And for the remote schema, I'm selecting the reference as store, which has the order query. So I'll go ahead and expand this. We can see the item, items, order, and orders. These are the queries that are exposed by the store uh, after server, the remote schema. So now you can see that inside the order, there's an argument called ID, which I can select. And, and for this ID, you can configure a mapping saying that, hey, this ID can be filled by this order ID value. This order ID, if you look at these fields, this ID, order ID, and status, this is coming from the fulfillment uh, schema. So for the fulfillment query, you're getting these values uh, as, as the result, right? So here we're using order ID. Now what we're doing essentially here is just passing the value of order ID from fulfillment as an input argument to the orders ID uh, in, the, in the store schema, right? So I'm gonna add this relationship now and I'm gonna head back to API. And by now this order ID should work and I should be able to not expand on ID though. I can expand on line items and I can also expand on item ID press, right? So if I make this query now, Essentially, what has happened is I'm getting the ID from the fulfillment. I'm getting this whole <clears throat> order object from the other schema, which is the store schema. And it's a separate GraphQL server that's running. Uh, and the status of the order, which is again coming from the fulfillment uh, GraphQL server. So you can run GraphQL servers independently managed by different teams. Uh, but now data can be combined for use cases which the clients in the front ends require, right? So this is GraphQL to GraphQL joins to independent GraphQL servers completely uh, written, managed in any language or framework, but then you're sharing data between them uh, declaratively. Uh, you don't need to modify any code in the upstream servers um, and, and, uh, and that's it, right? So it's just a configuration that you add here. The second demo that I wanted to show is, um, let's say the, the store API didn't exist. Let's say that the actual order information was available in a database like Postgres. So typically you would want to establish a relationship between this fulfillment API to the order information that's available in the database. So let's head to the data tab to see the order info tables. There's this order info table that I have with, with with a couple of fields, ID, total price, and created at. Uh, now we want this information to be available uh, as part of the fulfillment query when I expand the order information. Right? So again here, uh, notice that the ID is, is the common parameter that we're using to join this data. So there's always going to be some common element between two different schemas. Uh, it could be database schema, it could be a GraphQL schema that you've written there's always this common parameter that we use to merge this data, right? So we're gonna make use of this. So I'm heading to fulfillment, heading to relationship again. And instead of a remote schema, I'm selecting the remote database here. I'm gonna give this, let's say order info, and then create an object relationship. And here the source type would be again, fulfillment. And on the reference database, we have to select the database source, right? Which is the default public, and the table would be order info. We're just selecting the database and it could be from any database that we've connected as well with, right? So now the type map to the field would be order ID from the fulfillment API to the column, which is called ID in the order info uh, table of the reference table. This is the mapping. So this is the, this is the key uh, part in this whole setup. It's the mapping between your source and your reference. In this case, the source, is the remote schema and the reference is the database. It could be vice versa, where you can also set up a relationship from a database to a remote schema. And uh, and that's also another join 
possibility. Um, I'm going to add this relationship now, uh, head back to the API, um, and let's make a query to get the order info. And I get the ID and total price, and potentially the created at column, which was then the database. And you can see in the response that, um, again, this information is also not coming in. Um, this object is coming in from the database table, uh, uh, which is the order info. And this order is coming in from the second remote schema that, that is the store API. And, and fulfillment is the primary query, which is coming in from the first fulfillment GraphQL server. So technically we've joined across remote schemas and databases and, and, and you're getting it all uh, in, in the same response, right? This opens up a lot of possibilities for the front end clients or any client which is uh, fetching data from different sources. So the, the client doesn't need to know where this particular order object is coming in from or this order info is coming in from as long as they're able to fetch the state, right? So um, that's the power of GraphQL joins and, and, and you can now arbitrarily join between any of these sources from and to and, and, and you should be able to get the data up and running on your, on your client. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's it for my demo. Uh, happy to answer questions on chat. Thanks so much, Praveen. That is just one of the most amazing, uh, you know, parts of our, um, of this uh, data federation story we have here inside of Asura and how you're able to actually be able to build these super powerful applications. And it's something that we're really excited for uh, you, you're able to try out. Um, there's a couple of details I want to add on to that, but I'm going to actually go through a couple of slides first. First is in lieu of having a community present, uh, presenter today, I wanted to call your attention to our Hasura Awards, which will be happening at Hasura Con, which is also going to be replacing next month's community call. But Hasura Awards actually is an opportunity for you to either nominate yourself or nominate somebody you know in about any one of these categories. Uh, where people are using Hasura in interesting ways to build interesting products, you know, PR of the year, product for good, fastest go to market. It's all listed online. The link's been dropped in chat, so you can have a look there. Uh, but if you, if you think you qualify or you know somebody you think that qualifies, we would love to service those people at this year's Hasuricon. And there's actually prizes. So uh, definitely let us know. And we would, we would love to kind of see what it is you think is startup success of the year. So maybe that's you, but who knows? Um, and in terms of the uh, next month's community update, so next month, we're not going to be having a community call. Uh, the next community call will be in July. Uh, the next month is Graf is Hasuricon. So if you haven't got your tickets yet, definitely sign up for that. There's going to be a lot more of just great talks and great content around people building with Hasura, new features, all that kind of stuff. We're super excited to have you uh, join us there. Um, and then the, uh, if you have any questions under the week about the community or you want to reach out, have questions, you can find us on Discord. It's one of the best places to get those questions um, answered. And uh, I wanted to mention, um, I think I skipped a slide on accident somehow, but if you have questions about the remote schema joints, our data and API show is wrapped up now uh, for the summer, but we did a whole month on remote schema joints and uh, remote schema database. The whole month was on database joins, and we even had a little bonus on uh, getting free caching on top of remote schema joins. So that's interesting to you. Check out the YouTube channel for the Data and API show. We have more information on that there. Um, and then if you have any feedback about this call today or about anything about community in general, definitely reach out to us. We would love to hear your feedback because we want to make this a better place for you all. And with that being said, that actually takes us up and over for today's call. I appreciate you all sticking it out near to the end. And uh, that's going to be it for us today. Signing off for this month. We'll see you next month at Hasuricon. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. 